Are you at chapter 17? We're going to start about verse 13. Well, where is Paul? Paul's on his second missionary journey. He and Silas and, of course, Dr. Luke, they're in Greece. And they just got kicked out of Thessalonica. And now they're on to a place called Berea. And if you remember, men, the Thessalonicans, Thessalonicans, however you say it, um, they were rough on us. There were a lot of people that got saved there. And if you remember, he would first go to the synagogue, and then, of course, then that would often sponsor a bunch of questions that he would follow up on. And usually, a whole lot of folks got saved. That's what happened in Thessalonica. But then there were some that were jealous. We don't like you and anybody who looks like you, Paul, so out you go. So he stops off next at a place called Berea. And if you remember, the Bereans, they were good students. They listened. They're all, yeah. But then what did they do? They went home and they studied the scriptures to see if Paul was right. And now here we are picking up the story, chapter 17, verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was being preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. Head to the coast, uh, Paul, they're after you. You ever notice that um, when everybody's your friend, it's usually when you're telling them, yes, you know, I like you. I like you and throw an arm around. But people, when you tell them no, uh, they don't like you maybe as much. And if you notice that as a rule, wherever Paul went, he normally talked about Jesus Christ. Why the Christ? Who is the Christ? We turned to Isaiah 9 verse 6 last week. The Christ is wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. Jesus the Christ is that Jesus is a wonderful counselor, but he's also what? The mighty, and he is the everlasting, all at the same time. People love it when you are all about Jesus is a wonderful counselor, and you're all, I like that. I like it when my life goes off the rails a little bit and then Jesus comes after me and he rescues me. He chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I love those songs. Question, why does he have to keep coming after you? Fascinating idea. The church today, as you probably have noticed, there's a whole lot of what's in it for me. Please notice that wherever Paul went, he wasn't a seeker-friendly kind of guy. I mean, he was loving and he had a lot of grace for folks, but... He just taught God's word. In his day, that would be the Old Testament. They'd open up a scroll, he'd go into a section of scripture and explain about sin, about righteousness, and about that there's a judgment day coming. Please notice, wherever Paul went, there was usually not sort of a, y'all come in and let's have a great time, kind of feeling good about where we are right now. Please notice that once again, Paul is simply saying, if you don't have Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, then God says, you don't want me in this life, you won't have me in the next one either. And there is a very real place of hell. Now, is that seeker friendly as a rule? No. Notice that wherever Paul went, people said, we can't stand it. Just tell us about Jesus, the wonderful counselor. Comma, he's the mighty what? God, he's the everlasting whom? Father. And our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy is your name. Please notice that Paul, as a rule, was kind of not a mega church kind of guy. You better get to the sea. So off he goes. So Paul and Silas and Timothy Pardon me, uh, Silas and Timothy remain there in Berea, verse 15. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. You guys want to go to Athens? Just for a quick moment. I'm going to love to travel. Rick Steves uh, here at the pulpit today. Uh, go ahead if you wouldn't mind. Let's look at it. Well, there's the Mediterranean Sea, the nations they're in. Hit the go button. And there's Greece. Greece, by the way, if you didn't know, um, Athens was there and people were in Athens when Moses was in the deserts of Sinai. Uh, go ahead and hit the go button. Let's zoom in. And there's Athens right there. 
do you see the bottom sort of, or middle-ish bottom left? There's a bit of a, an island, but it's connected by a small little isthmus. It's that isthmus. I can't say that again. It's that little land bridge that Paul had to cross that's going to take him to Corinth, which is his next stop. But in the bottom little section where you see Kalamata, that's where Sparta is. And Athens and Sparta, of course, were sparring often together. But there's Athens, you guys. Go ahead. Here is the cradle of Western civilization. This is the birthplace of democracy. Um, if you love history, you gotta love Greece, and you gotta love Athens. Look how breathtaking that is. That's the Mediterranean Sea in the uh, background there, and that's what's left of the Parthenon. What's the Parthenon? Go ahead. Let's look at it from another angle. Uh, there's the Parthenon. Can you believe that that building is over, oh, I don't know, some would say close to 2,500 years old. I can't even get my house to be painted for more than four or five years. How amazing is that? In the background there, um, what you see, uh, what is that mountain? That is Mount uh, Lakobatia. I'm probably mispronouncing that. See that little spit of a uh, mountain in the background? Well, the Greeks said, well, what was happening was when Athena was building the Acropolis, that's what that sort of mound of rock is where the Parthenon sits on top, um, when she was um, bringing land for the Parthenon, she tripped and she dropped a piece, and that's what that mountain is in the background. 900 feet above sea level, there's a beautiful amphitheater out there. And then I would love to go there someday and sit and listen to a concert. But anyway, in the foreground, you'll notice, hit our go button, that little section of outcropping, that's Mars Hill, and it's also called the Areopolis. One more picture, go ahead. Here's an artist's rendition of perhaps what it might have looked like. So there's the, uh, the powerful, huge um, Parthenon at the top, intact. And you notice the statue of the dude with a spear. Why? Because Athena was the Greek goddess of war and wisdom. And then in the foreground where all those people are gathered, that's the Areopolis and the Greek word or Greek god for, um, pardon me, the Latin word, for what the Romans had, for their god of war is Mars. So the Areopolis for the Greeks and Mars Hill for the Romans. So go ahead and leave that up if you would as we keep cruising. How many of you loved your little trip to Athens today? Isn't that awesome? Uh, pick up your gift bags in the gift shop on the way outside. <laughs> Athens, the cradle of Western civilization, the birthplace of democracy the home of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, and that's where the Raiders first played all those years ago. And they didn't win even then, yeah, Larry. They were losers. They were mathematically eliminated from the playoffs from day one. They always have been. Anyway, this is intellectualism's capital city. If you know at all uh, Western civilization and the history they're in, who did Athens and Greece play a major part did you know that there were over 3,000 altars and temples for different deities? Um, the um, uh, Acropolis at the very top, that's the temple to Athena, also called the Parthenon. She was the goddess of war and wisdom. Then around town, you had the temple of Aphrodite. She had temple prostitutes, both male and female. And uh, that was a pretty popular hangout, as you might imagine. Worship there to justify men's sexual promiscuity. Of course, you had the, two, the uh, temple to Zeus, and you had the temple to Bacchus. Who was Bacchus? He was the god, the god who you celebrated with alcohol and debauchery. So his place was always packed, as you might imagine. Okay, now verse 16. So these 3,000 statues and temples and obelisks of all kinds. Verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for those guys to meet him there in Athens, Paul's spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Yeah, there were a bunch of them. Verse 17. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily were those who happened to be there. And then certain Epicureans, who this is named after our boy Epicurus, who was uh, ep especially curious, Epic no, probably not. 
He said and taught that the world, this world here under the sun, that's all there is really. That's all you get. And when you close your eyes here, you're done. So go nuts. Live it up. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we... That's your Epicurus. That's his, that's his mantra. And there is no eternal ramification. So feed the flesh. Luxurious taste, eating and drinking. So you had those guys. And then you had the Stoics. That's the other side of the spectrum. They were founded by Zeno of Citium, uh, about 300 years in front of Paul. Virtue is based on knowledge, science, mathematics, logic over emotions. How does he say that? Live long and prosper. I blew that one. That opportunity sort of went, came and went. But that's Spock. He was one of those guys. Divine reason, they would say, was in the form of fate and providence. And uh, that's what governs all things. So self-discipline over fortune and pleasure and mind over emotion. So they're the other side of the spectrum. So this is Luke the doctor who's telling you here in the book of Acts. He had both sides of the spectrum and probably everyone in beneath. Everyone in between. So anyway, you have your Epicureans, you get the Stoics. Both of the philosophers encountered him there, um, Paul, in the marketplace. And some said, what is this babbler saying? And others said, well, he seems to be proclaiming that there's foreign God, to be a proclaimer, pardon me, of foreign gods. Because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. I've got a quote here from a historian. The Epicurean said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Live the good life, relax. Take it easy. Epicureans were couch potatoes. <laughs> the Stoics, on the other hand, were the aerobics instructors. <laughs> Be disciplined, they said. Free yourself from anything that is emotional, sensual, or material. The Epicureans said, enjoy life. The Stoics said, endure life. But neither considered an eternal life. Man, I wish I could think of stuff like that. That's good. Verse 19. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. There it is. Um, on the, uh, that whole mound really is collectively known as the Areopagus. Are well, that place. But it's also known, of course, that's the Ath Athena. Uh, she was the Greek goddess of war, but the, but the Romans, they were Latinized. And so they called their god of war Mars. So that little gathering of people there, right by that food truck, as you see, uh, that's Mars Hill. Um, seeing we know what this, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. So where do you go? You go right there. The Areopolis, Areopagus, uh, was also a long place where there was um, judgment and uh, the, uh, the Council of Athens often met there. And so it became really kind of the city square. And if you needed to talk to something about something important, well, that's where you go. Verse 21, for all the Athenians and foreigners who were there spent their time, look at this, and nothing else, just chewing the fat each uh, trying to proclaim how much more smarter they were than the other lame -o that was trying to argue whatever. That's what humans love to do. Uh, nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. The Areopagus, Mars Hill, where the smartest people in the civilized world hung out. Where the Council of Education and Religion met daily, probably even during the time of Paul. So whenever a new religious thought was preached, it had to clear the council of education and religion. Fascinating. The Athenians, largely regarded as some of the smartest men in history, please check it out, they believed that religion and education were inseparable. Just for your consideration, the smartest humans perhaps who ever lived saw a strong correlation with religion and education. And I couldn't help but think, and I wrote my margin, my, oh, my, how far we've come from that today. 
It pains me to bring this up, but some of you remember it's March the 22nd of this year. As the Senate confirmation hearing for potential Supreme Court judge candidate Ketanji Brown Jackson went into its 13th hour, Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee asked the nominee to define the word woman. Mr. Jackson, being considered for the highest intellectual position in the nation, replied, I can't. I'm not a biologist. Um, for your consideration, remember Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe to those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and that sweet is bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. That's kind of where we are. We're so advanced that one of the highest intellectual platforms of ascension in this nation. Please answer this simple question. What is a woman? And all of that nonsense was chasing through her brilliant mind, and she is brilliant. And the culture effectively says, you can't say that. Hold your finger here. Would you join me quickly in the book of 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. A lot of you know this one by heart, but it seemed interesting. Remember Mars Hill, the smartest humans who ever lived in the estimation of many. They knew, saved or not, they knew that the inner compass has to be right before any external culture will work. We've largely thrown that away. Are you in 2 Timothy? Look at chapter 4. Look at verse 1. Hey, Timothy, I charge you. That's a strong word. Timothy, you got to get this one, bud. you got to get it. I charge you, therefore, before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ. How important is this next thought? Who is going to judge the living and the dead? At his appearing, at his coming, or his kingdom. Verse 2, please read these three words with me. Preach the word. Preach the word. And I believe that many pastors believe that that's what they're doing. But you have to know the context of what Paul says. When Paul says teach the word, he doesn't mean smatterings roll through the scroll. Another little verse here, because... He never approached sort of his listening crowd with a topic and then picks and chooses little pieces of the Bible. Paul borrowed from the book of Isaiah, line upon line, precept upon precept. How would we say that today? Verse by verse. When Paul says preach the word, please understand he's not mean a topical message smattered and sprinkled with a few verses to buttress the main thesis of the pastor. When Paul says Timothy preached the word, he is meaning the whole counsel. How would we say that? Verse by verse, chapter by chapter. So Paul, make sure your methodology is not largely topical. Make sure it's the whole counsel. Make sure it's what Isaiah said, line upon line, precept upon precept. Be ready in season and out of season, meaning there's going to come fads when verse-by-verse verse Bible study will be cool, and there'll be seasons when it is not. In my simple estimation, I kind of think we're in that latter season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort. That's what pastors are supposed to do. We love the exhort. Uh, come along, buddy, and throw my arm around. But did you see the word convince? That's the word that also could be rendered reprove, prove it again and again and again in the scriptures. And sometimes, what's that R word there? Rebuke. When's the last time you heard a pastor say, um, Read a section of scripture, teach it. And if the teaching happens to be about don't sleep with your girlfriend or boyfriend, what should the pastor say to the crowd? Don't sleep with your girlfriend or boyfriend. Don't cheat 
on your taxes, any number of places where the Bible talks about. But as you know, as a rule today, the Laodicean sort of flow is don't upset the tithers. I mean the people in the pews. But look at this. Convince, which is to reprove, rebuke sometimes, and of course exhort with all suffering and teaching. Why? Look at verse 3. For the time will come when they, the listening audience, will not endure sound doctrine. Oh, my goodness. I endure the dentist. Oh, I pray that, that, that us going through verse by verse and going back, in, back in the Bible and forward in the Bible is not boring to you. I hope so. I hope it's not. Endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, there's going to come a day when they will heap up for themselves teachers and they're going to turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Do you know what a fable is? A fable is a story with a moral. Now, you get to pick your moral and then, of course, you can choose your story. The idea of, I went to the mall and I saw some things and then I dropped my ice cream and then the moral of that story is, and I, and, and I do love illustrations. I love stories that do illustrate God's word. But is it kind of a steady diet these days when a lot of the pastors are telling you a story with a moral? But it's not scripture for your consideration. You need to be turned away from fables. Pardon me. These people will be turned to fables. Don't teach me the Bible verse by verse. Tell me some fables. Okay, back to the book of Acts. Please notice that these people in Athens, they're like, we're interested. Why don't you tell us more there at Mars Hill? Verse 22. Well, so Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, which is Mars Hill, and he said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious because what's hanging around the city? 3,000 statues and temples. And parenthetically, in my opinion, the next few sections of Scripture are going to be Paul's most polished, most well thought out, culture current message ever. He's going to cite Dr. Phil. Well, he doesn't, it's the Dr. Phil of his age, not a believer. Uh, but from the Greek sort of understanding, he's going to name a guy, name a guy's work here, and they're going to go, "Oh yeah, it's Dr. Phil. That's a, that's um, Oprah, you know." Great introduction, powerful illustrations, a sequential order of immutable principles. <laughs> and when you go to homiletics class in seminary, which is to say preaching, you better hit all the five G's if it's going to be a good sermon. What do you mean? Well, in verse twenty-five, we're going to see the greatness of God. The goodness of God. Verse 26 and 27, the government of God. Verses 28 and 29, the glory of God. Verses 30 through 34, the grace of God. That's good stuff. But please notice, please notice verse 34 when we get there. Let's jump in. All right, here you go. Uh, by the way, you go to the Areopagus today and there's a, it doesn't look anything like that, of course, but cemented into the wall is this following little section of Scripture. Paul's actual Mars Hill sermon is dedicated in a plaque there if you go there today. And, and for an extra five bucks, the, the guide will let you touch it. I, I made that last part up. For I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, says Paul, and they're all around him. And looks, look what's right over Paul's shoulder. I have even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Good job, Paul. This is what you call an attention grabber. Oh, I know about that. Athens had over 3,000 deity statues. So just in case they missed one, to show everybody how smart we are, we made one too in case we missed one. That's what that God is. Therefore, the one, notice capital O, he's talking about God now. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing I'm going to tell you who that guy is. Him is who I'm proclaiming to you. Verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, 
nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he, the real God, needed such things, since he gives all life and breath to all things. Have you ever noticed when humans make up their own gods, they get a little crazy? Look at those buildings. Look what they did for Athena. Look at that massive statue, you know. When humans make up their own gods, you notice uh, we are given to fluffing up their images. Um, God told Moses, it's the second commandment, don't make any images of me. Notice that, second commandment. Um, All the altars that I'm going to instruct you to build, I do not want my face on any of it. And in fact, I want it usually made of dirt, brass, or rocks. And if you're going to use the rocks, don't put a tool to them. What do you mean? Don't shape them in these ornate things that humans, a thousand years later, are going to walk into the museum. Ooh, don't do that. Why, God? Have you ever seen pictures of a, of a, of a how do I say this? I'm thinking of some of the, the Roman Catholic edifices. I've had a good chance and occasion to visit Europe at time. At one time, and you go into some of those churches, wow. How many of you have ever seen pictures or been to St. Peter's Basilica? Whew. That is so much volume and height. Did you know if the atmospheric conditions are right, it'll fog and even rain inside, little microclimates. And how impressive is that? Blow your hair back. That's what humans do. Humans, your brains, the Lord might be thinking, could never really grasp who I am anyway. Uh, Remember, eye is not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of, of, of any human how cool I really am. So any image that you would create would be way short. So I don't want any. Oh, and by the way, then people would begin to worship the greatly inferior image and miss me entirely. Second, people love images, especially of themselves. The selfie. Do you know you can get paid jillions of dollars if you are an influencer? And here's a picture of me wearing a hat. Chiki, you know, there's my hat. One where my hat is? Click on the button. Chiki, this is me in my makeup. This is me with my dog. This is me building a whatever. It's in us all. We love it. Soon they're going to forget me, says the Lord, and fall in love with the God that they made up. That's important, Harvest. What is idolatry? Um, In my simple mind, can I say idolatry is simply making up your own God? That's what it is. And then if you want to, you make a statue of it. Idolatry. Making up your own God versus what God has plainly said. And harvest for your consideration, the less Bible I know, the greater chance I have in making a God, little g, in my image, not the other way around. There's a ton of idolatry in the church today, in my estimation. Jesus is my buddy who winks at my sin, and he hangs out with sinners. You know, Jesus would hang out with sinners. No Sinners were drawn to him. And there were a time or two when he ate with them, but as a rule, he did not hang out with them. They were drawn to him. And in every occasion, he didn't sit at the bar into the wee hours of the morning. He would love, exude life, and teach. And oh, by the way, at the end of every single encounter with a bunch of non-saved people, he would always say with great compassion, you gotta change. You gotta change. This lifestyle is killing you. Jesus did not hang out with sinners. The people who were destroying their lives came to him because he had life and truth. Then he required them to change their destructive lifestyle. And as you notice in the scriptures, some did repent and were truly saved, but most did not, and frankly, most do not. Hold your finger. Can I take you to one more rabbit trail? Go to the Gospel of Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. By the way, and parenthetically, if you would uh, really want to hear what the heart of the Lord is, Matthew 5, 
6 and 7. Matthew chapters 5, 6 and 7. Pretty plain, all that is on the heart of the Lord. We're in chapter 7. Look down there, please, to verse number 21. Red letters, right? So who's talking? That's Jesus. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Oh, my. Can I rephrase that? Not everybody who uttered the sinner's prayer, not everybody, not every one of those, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Here's who does. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, what day is he speaking of? That's judgment day. Lord, Lord. Man, I sang all the songs. I went to every, every church service of that mega church, and I felt good every single time I walked out and the pastor assured me that God loved me just like I am and that I'm good, more or less, in this fashion. Please notice that, please notice that it's the conviction of my sin that is the basis of true conversion. So a lot of, anyway, a lot of those people who sat for all kinds of Sunday services, Lord, Lord, many will say to me on judgment day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Isn't that kind of an advanced Christian sort of thing? Cast out demons in your name. Well, there you go. Well, don't forget the sons of Sceva. We'll get to him later in the book of Acts. What were they? There was Jesus. Um, he could cast out demons with a word, and then so could his disciples. And evidently, it was a kind of, a, a kind of an industry that if you got a, a, a demon got the best of you, well, then you would hire these guys and they would do the doodah and do the shang shang and the hoo ha and the, all that kind of stuff and bada bing, bada boom. Uh, you're not possessed anymore unless you, unless you don't pay, then we repossess you. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's painful, I know it is. But do you remember the story of the sons of Sceva? They evidently saw the powerful effect of Peter and uh, John and those guys casting out demons in Paul, so they begin to do it themselves. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, who command you to leave, and evidently had run into some success until they ran into a particularly difficult demon. We command you in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches, get out. Crickets. Demon threw the fellow, looked at them. Well, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Um, Cut to the exterior of the building. Crash! They come flying through the, through the, the I, don't, I meant to say plate glass saloon windows, but they didn't have those. They came crashing out, bruised and bleeding. Were they saved? At least not at the moment. So can it happen? Yes. We cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. We gave, we we fed the homeless well on Thanksgiving and we did all the programs that were around the church and Jesus could say to them, I never knew you, watch. And then I will declare to them, I what? Never knew you. There are some people that believe if you're truly born again that you can lose that salvation if you act and misbehave badly enough. They don't understand what the cross was. Perfect theology, understanding is how much sin did Jesus pay for on the cross? The first until the very last one. You see that, right? Because remember, God the Father can see the beginning and the end at the same time. When Jesus was expiring on the cross, the Father put how much of all the sins world on him? All of it. Okay? So how much sin did Jesus pay for? All. Fast forward the film. There's the day that perhaps you, you said the sinner's prayer. And if you meant it, is salvation given to you? And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. How long does everlasting last? If there was a sudden end when God says, man, am I disappointed with you, pal? I didn't think you were gonna do that. Give me back my salvation. You're not thinking in the terms that God is multidimensional. God sees the future. And if he died on the cross for how much sin? Then that one that some would say put you over the mark and God ripped his salvation away. Would that make logical sense? Can you uh, surprise God? 
because he knows everything. Can you disappoint God? No. I heard somebody go, I can hear the tires squealing. What? Let me say it again. Theologically speaking, can you disappoint God? Remember what disappointment is. Man, I thought you were going to do this over here. But then you ended up doing that, and I'm, I didn't expect you to do that. If you cannot surprise God, can you disappoint him? No, because how much of your boneheadedness is on the cross? Does that make logical sense, Harvest? Are there people who said the sinner's prayer and then lived a terrible life? Yes, but Jesus told us that was going to happen. The seed that goes out on how, on how many heart conditions? Four. Remember, two of those heart conditions had what appeared to be some fruit for a minute. But eventually they went back to their old parts. Back to this verse 23 one more time. And I'm going to declare to those who said, Lord, Lord, I never knew you. Meaning, you were never truly born again. Very important. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What is lawlessness? That's living your life as if God never gave you a law to do it differently. And if that doesn't really bother you, it doesn't matter how many services you go to or how much money you put in the bucket, how many programs and how feeding the homeless you do. If you are not truly convicted, man, am I a sinner. The Holy Spirit has a large part in that. If you can quiet your brain and environment enough for a second, and if you're not born again in the presence of a holy God, it will occur to you in a powerful moment, I believe. If I were to die right now, I wouldn't go to heaven. I'm not a, I, we used to do it here at Harvest. If you want to receive Jesus, raise your hand. and I, I can see the practice of that. But I don't really do that anymore because I don't want anybody to raise a hand and say, well, I raised my hand that one time at Harvest, so I'm good. The real name of the game is what are you practicing? Are you practicing a life as if God never told you don't do that? Don't go there. Don't hang with those people. This could be you. Oh, I pray you're born again. How do I get born again, Pastor Steve? He did all the work. When he said that one of the last things he said right before, Father, I give my spirit into your hands, he said, it is, say it with me, finished. What does that mean? All sin. He did all the work. So what he does is he says, now it's your choice, and he, he gives you the opportunity. I'm not going to shove it down your throat, but if you want to, here is salvation. All you have to do is receive it. Intellectually, I get it. The Christ, the Messiah, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father was on that cross for me. He took all of my sin, and now he's doing this to me. Oh, Steve, this is the only way that you and I can live forever in eternity. Please receive. But I'm not going to shove it down your throat. Intellectually, Jesus says, God zipped up a human suit and died on a cross. Now, with my heart, oh, yes. I need that salvation, Lord. Please, please, may it be true of me today. In Jesus' name. Then the Bible says the Holy Spirit, another uniform that the singular God wears. He is in your heart and then he's inside of your heart and mind and then you begin to look at things a whole lot different. Then without even really trying, you'll notice that you're going to see fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. A lot of churches and a lot of religions and a lot of sort of options for your eternity. Would you please consider the only religious option that says, God came down to my level. I can never get to his level. Let's continue, and uh, I promise I'll go a lot faster from here. 
Verse 26, please. Chapter 17, Acts, verse 26. And when he has made, and he, God, has made from one blood, what he's saying there is, uh, all humans came from one dude, uh, one man, Adam, and every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, that is to say, their nations, so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Let me sort of boil that down. His purpose was for all nations to seek after God. Then God would see to it that all those people would find their way to him. Why? Because he's so close. Parenthetically, ever notice that whenever a nation oversteps its God-given boundaries, look what happens. We're going to have prejudice. We're going to have racial conflict, ethnos against ethnos. We're going to see oppression, death, and even genocide. We're seeing it currently in the Ukraine. Did you know that starting with the with the Tower of Babel, one of the reasons why God conf confounded all of the languages, because he wanted people to live in separate nations. Did you know that? Now, there's only one way that humans can live singularly together, like a family. But it has to be when all sin has been dealt with and separated. Until then, did you know that... Um, God designed a diversity of nations to protect all peoples from despots and megalomaniacs. Remember the whole Tower of Babel thing was under Nimrod, his idea. Hey, let's make an observatory to chart all the stars so we can worship our own God. Until Jesus Christ returns and fixes the planet and rules and reigns with perfect righteousness till that day, Lucifer is going to continue to raise up Hitlers and Napoleons and Stalins and Putins and finally the Antichrist himself. And by the time Judgment Day finally rolls around, all the humans, including angels and demons, will know without a shadow of a doubt humans can't truly unite in heart and mind except through Jesus Christ. That's what the judgment day is largely about. Verse 28. For in him, talking about Jesus, we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets said, he's actually going to cite uh, the Phil, uh, Dr. Phil of his day. He's actually citing the Greek poet Aratus, Aratus from Paul's own homeland. Um, and here's what he's citing. Here's what Dr. Phil says. How's that working for you? No, he says, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think about think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Let me paraphrase that. Since God made us, wouldn't the real God need not need some statue designed by humans? Then make it from gold and silver and stone. The real God makes us, not the other way around. And all the fellows at the Areopagus are going, oh, yeah, good point, good point, Paul. Verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Now commanding all men everywhere, including Washoe County, to say with me, Repent. Not to feel glad and, and feel, I go to church because it makes me feel good. And if pastor's not on his game, or the songs aren't to my liking, well, then there was a bad service, and I don't like that. Church isn't for us, Harvest. It's for him, verse 31, to repent. Because he has anointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. Hey, you Stoics and Epicureans, there is an eternity and there is a judgment day. Righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. That's our boy Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Hey, about all you uh, Aristotles and Plato's and all those guys. How are they doing? They're uh, decomposing, as you know. Verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, wait a minute, wait a minute, some mocked. 
while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Why don't you come back tomorrow? So if you will, remember I told you, watch out for verse 34. Look at this. So Paul departed from among them, and however some, uh, circle that word, that's the Greek word, tis, T-I-S, or T-I-S-S, tis. And it means a tiny, could be rendered minuscule amount. However, very few men joined him or believed. Among them was a guy by the name of Dionysius, and he was an Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. So there wasn't many. Question. When Paul gave his messages and sometimes tossed out of his city, let's see, he stopped in Philippi. Did he start a church there? He sure did. We have a letter, Philippians. Then he was at Thessalonica. Do we have a church there? Yes. First and second, Thessalonians, etc., etc. Everywhere Paul went, he formed a church. Except where? Athens. What? What did this informed, logical, no seriously, let's knock heads about evolution or young earth or religious nationalism or the founding fathers? I know about culture, current stuff. How did it work with Paul here at least? It was, uh, I'm so more informed than you are, dude. You're nuts. I'm smart. See ya. Or, hey, we love this intellectual jousting match. Can we do it again tomorrow? Look at verse 34. How many people got saved of Paul's beautiful message? All five G's are there. How many people actually got saved? Very few. Now we're done with this chapter, but I want to leave you with one more. Where was Paul's next step after Athens? He went to Corinth. Is there a church there, Harvest? Let's check it out. First Corinthians, please. First Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He does go on to Corinth. Remember, he had the smartest individuals and humans in the estimation of many, some of the smartest humans who ever lived. He did the right thing in that he told them about the important five G's and he made an excellent sermon complete with illustrations. He even cited Dr. Phil. What did Paul get away from, at least on Mars Hill? He got away from Jesus the Christ, him crucified. But he did sneak in the resurrection. I wonder if Paul went, let me sort of revisit that whole interchange. A lot of people said, you're nuts. Many of them said, we love this intellectual jousting. Let's do it some more. He leaves he goes to Corinth, chapter 2, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 1. Hey, you remember when I showed up there, the church there in Corinth? And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellency of speech or wisdom. I just did that in Athens. I didn't do that. Or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined I determined not to know anything among you. No more fables. What's a fable? A story with a moral. I came knowing, determined to know only one thing. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Harvest, I got to let you know. Let's all stand together. I got to let you know. Praise God for every church in our Truckee Meadows, amen. And I hope as God puts them on your heart or you're driving by, I hope we're praying for every single church, every single pastor. But we went through the book of Acts for a number of reasons, but one of them is, do we want the kind of church that we see in the book of Acts? I know I do. And here was a big one today. Everywhere Paul went, Jesus the Christ and all that that means, God had to come to my level. Him crucified and all that that means. Humans can't do anything about getting out of sin, not on their own. And that Jesus Christ is resurrected and all of that means. He has power over death and demons. Would you join me in prayer? 
Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that the gospel is not hard. I want to thank you, Lord, that Paul figured it out. He said, hey, Timothy, um, I'm writing you here because I'm incarcerated here uh, in Rome and I'm weeks away from my own demise. But don't worry, I run a good race and I fought the good fight. I'm the wine offering now being poured out. The last portion of the worship service at the temple in Jerusalem. I'm, that's where I'm at. Timothy, you're the young buck now. You've walked with me. You've traveled with me. You've seen me in action. And my last parting thought to you is, Timothy, don't do topical. Preach the whole counsel of God, line upon line, precept upon precept. Don't use a lot of fables, stories with a nice moral. Teach them God's word. Let the Holy Spirit's conviction do the rest. Teach the hard parts. Teach the fun parts. Teach the prophecy. Oh, Timothy, don't teach the prophecy. It scares me. Teach it, Timothy. Teach it all. Don't ever stop. Teach it all. Jesus the Christ, him crucified and resurrection. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Some are going to like it and they're going to move away. I never knew them. Most will not like it, not one bit. And Timothy, here's how you're going to know you're doing it right. Because all who want to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. Timothy, if you look out and you've got a whole lot of people smiling back at you, we love this place. For your consideration, Timothy, are you doing it right? Are you teaching the gospel? the conviction of sin, righteousness, and of judgment to come. Sin, what I shouldn't be doing. Righteousness, what I should be doing. And that there's a judgment day, and are you ready for it? Everybody sit down, please, and eyes closed for a minute longer. Are you born again? Are you? I hope you are. In fact, hope's not a good enough word. I'm desperate that you are. Harvest, did you know that it has now been confirmed that there are Iranian technicians teaching Russians how to fire, how to steer these UAVs? Did you know that's out there? Let me rephrase that for you. Ezekiel 38 and 39, Persia and Gog and Magog are buddies. Did you know that's in the scripture? 150 years ago, who cares about Iran? They weren't even on the map until after World War I. Who cares about the Russians? No big deal. Are they a big deal today? Did you know that was in the scriptures? This pastor is trying to say to you, we are so close to Jesus' return. Are you born again? Have you given the Lord all of your life? With your mind, do you get it? God zipped up a human suit for me. He paid for all of my sins. Now, with your heart, please, today, right now, say, Jesus, I give you all of my life. I need that salvation. Now, please fill me with your Holy Spirit. And mean it with every fiber of your being. Holy Spirit, come. Now if that's you and if you're truly born again, now watch. The Holy Spirit is now living in your life. And things are going to look different from here. And God promises if you get into the word, I'm going to show you where to put every step. In Jesus' name and now all of us who love Jesus said, Amen. 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 Hey, God bless you. We'll see you on Tuesday night, Harvest for Prayer.